Thompson and uh, a very good morning to everybody. Um, I haven't been around for a long time. So That's right. We are happy to have you. It's good to be here today. Mm -hmm. um, so first of all, let me commend the uh, Fourth Estate uh, for, for the work that they've done. I think it's triggered a very important conversation about the, the use of scholarships. Uh, but it's also important to commend them on advancing the, uh, the, the scope and the development of the law and the regime around the RTI. That's right. I think they, they, they were cited as one of the organizations that have frequently used the, uh, the RTI, and I think uh, that's, that's the, right, the right way to go. Not and actually all, one of the organization that, literally, yeah. that has used the RTI the most. The most, yeah. exactly. And then also the RTI Commission for, you know, continue to persist mm. with um, the, the issue of the recalcitrance of a lot of the entities that still want to be in the old order where uh, information, public information is opaque. But, you know, even in the RTI, there is a clear principle of proactive disclosure. That's right. And if you look at Section 3 of the Act, all entities, 12 months after the coming into force of the Act, are every year required to publish or update a manual which captures all the information that they want to disclose to the public. So that now I should go to the Scholarship Secretariat website. I should see a manual that says this is the information we generate on this entity. And that should even guide me to be able to know what information may be exempt and not. Of course, this has not happened, and it's something that uh, we need to also ask the Ministry of Information what we are doing about it, and also the RTI Commission, because they are supposed to provide uh, guidelines you know, around this. I, for when I was uh, uh, asked to come uh, and, and, and join the panel, I sort of spent some time just looking at scholarship schemes across the world and so on. You go to the Indian government scholarship uh, website. Very detailed, very clear eligibility requirements, including on what is DD or, or what represents economic, uh, what your, your income level is. Clearly stated. And sometimes I get shocked when people suggest that, you know, somehow we are not able to determine who is DD or brilliant. When we have been doing social protection programs, uh, even countries are, are categorized by, you know, their poverty levels. You know, we used to talk about the dollar a day, this and that. The Saskia service spends time in categorizing who is poor, who is extreme poor, Governments actually do policies, give monies based on these things. So nobody can tell me that in today's Ghana, they cannot make a distinction as to who is poor and who is needy. If there is a lack of class, or if there is a reinterpretation, then of course we'll get to that in terms of what we need to do to make sure that there is no confusion. But to come to the substantive matter, this is not new, and, and it's a very important question, uh, observation, because when people say, oh, why are people generalizing that the scholarship secretariat is being abused? We recall in 2020 when uh, uh, the audit service published um, a report, a performance audit they did on the, it wasn't even, a, it was the GET Fund. The GET Fund had usurped the exactly. job of the scholarship, the scholarship secretary secretariat and was given the scholarships directly. That's right. And this covered the period 2012 to 2018, but this was published in 2020. And there, 86 beneficiaries were cited. And I think even a report to parliament was made that some of these people did not, because the GET Fund is very clear about who is needy and who is brilliant, and that these uh, scholarship are supposed to go for Ghanaian programs. It right. doesn't, and then there is this uh, discretion that is given in uh, 2E or so. Section, section 2D yeah. emphasizes that it has to be given local scholarship. Yes. 
So you pay for the person to attend school in Ghana. That's right. Then the E yeah. opened a certain window. That is where I want yeah. to really spend yeah. some time yeah. because I think for all of those listening to us, it's really important to understand that when people, there, there's this culture and this belief that when you are given discretionary power, you can do pretty much what you want. And just listening to Mr. Kinsley, uh, Ajimai, in his responses to the fourth estate, he keeps coming up with reasons why he thinks somebody will, you know, maybe qualify. They may be twins. They may be this. The double they, beneficiary. They don't have beneficiaries and so on. He said it could be twins. <laughs> and that, that for me, betrays a, a certain level of ignorance about the, uh, uh, the fetus that even currently, where we think we know, it's not even enough, but the fetus that govern the use of discretion, and that if you are in public service and you are not aware of this, it, it, for me, it, it is problematic, and maybe that's where we start. But just to remind everybody, there is a clear conflict of interest in Jiangxing for all public officers at that chapter 24 of the Constitution in Article 284. So if you discharge your public duties to favor someone because they belong to your party or... Uh, you know the person or you like their face or whatever. In simple terms, you are denying a fair opportunity to all the Ghanaians who are eligible, whose taxpayers' money you are using to give these scholarships out. So this, this idea that, oh, if, if I have discretion power, I can do anything. They say you cannot put your private benefit. And if me and you are in a party, and for the good of the party, or to reward party members, we get to public service and we are handing out this as gifts. Yeah, for our private benefit, it, it would be great. But the, the Constitution is very clear that you can use state resources for that purpose. Similarly, if you have discretionary power under Article 296, you are obliged to be fair and candid. You cannot be arbitrary. You cannot be capricious. You cannot be biased either based on resentment, prejudice, personal dislike, and you must act in accordance with due process of law. And these provisions are very important restraints to discretion power. And if it was not for the Supreme Court decision in Ranford, France, mm. an attorney general, Article 296C is probably even our best protection because it said that if you were not a judicial officer, you were obliged to publish by a constitutional instrument or statutory instrument how you were going to govern a discretionary power. Guidelines. Yeah, in terms of your guidance. And if you really think about it, and you know, here I always, every time I meet Dr. Ayili, I said, he, was, he is the one that has caused this problem because he was the one that went to use the word belt now that if we apply this provision, it will be a better. But I thought, for me, the Supreme Court got it wrong. And also, I thought that the idea that the Supreme Court can suspend a mandatory requirement of the Constitution, it's, a problem. it's, not, it's, it's just a no-no. And it's something that we have to go for a review. But if you the think... The Supreme Court, in the matter involving, I think, the Bright Quete on the Chief Justice, mm -hmm. Oh, the title can't escape my memory this way. Was very categorical. Right, I quit an AG. No, that was not the title. Thank you. Okay. Um, it was very categorical through Sophia Kufu. Okay. That this injunction, yeah. that you must publish guidelines mm -hmm. for how you exercise a discretion, mm -hmm. is mandatory. Yes. And actually required yeah. that the, the CJ will even publish some regarding how to mm, impeach very much so. the head of a constitutional, yes. uh, independent constitutional body. Yes. Yeah. So I think, I think really for me, it's, it's due for a review because <laughs> it is, it, it's really damaging. I mean, and if you, it's interesting that uh, in uh, uh, Professor Datiba's uh, judgment, he referred to the, uh, I think the 1969 constitution, which used the same language and provided the justification they had made, that they had considered all the other measures and said no. But how are we going to track? How many times do people even know the number of statutory instruments that are 
are laid before parliament. You, you, you are not, you'll be there one day you are transacting a business with the state and realize there's a new law that you didn't have any opportunity to participate in, whatever. But they, after looking at that, to say that, oh, well, if you do this, there's a nuclear meltdown. But for the scholarship secretariat, yeah. they have actually shown that this is how they would do it. And Baumia launched that no. and, and said there will be transparency. I think the problem has to do with the implementation, which is our bane in this country, isn't, I, I isn't it? I think it's even beyond that. Uh, and, and, you know, just before I even land on that point, I, because I also feel that even from a common law position, if you think about the, the doctrine of legitimate expectation, which really it has changed the way we view administrative law, that you know you have to be heard, you have to uh, 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 laws have to be predictable, you have to be fair. This kind of decision completely sort of even uh, you know undermine that that doctrine. But when I listen to uh, Dr. Baumian, I even when I read the scholarship secretariat. It is, it's very clear, it's very clear that the way we see the solution is in terms of access to the applications, right? It's in, in terms of the access to the applications and not when even the accountability structure and how we assess fairness, how we are making judgments about uh, what is the objective of a scholarship scheme in our context. If you read what's on the website, the general broad framework is tied to uh, the national development plans, it's tied to uh, particular government uh, policy uh, objectives, but it doesn't break it down and say, oh, we are lacking 10 engineers in nuclear science or whatever. And therefore, in this year, Okay. We want, to, we want to do those things. Yeah, thank so, you, Dr. So Asante. Right. That's thank you, Dr. Asante. And 